What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome back. At least, I'm welcoming my, myself back, because I haven't been here in a long time. Got a new sound system. You can kind of see it. It's pretty nice. Uh, I really like it. The audio's been, like, pretty terrible, and I finally figured out how to do proper focus, and I even got a light mounted on it this time, so improvements. Special thanks to uh, Daniel on Discord and my DMs, uh, motivating me to increase quality. So I've been definitely uh, been working pretty hard uh, to that end to be able to uh, produce good quality audio and potentially video. So we'll get there. So uh, tonight's, uh, tonight's video, tonight's question comes from Acolytes. Uh, Mr. C.S. Joseph, what is your exact position on the red pill? And it's like, okay, great. It's about time someone decided to actually ask me that question. So many people think that I'm just, you know, they just assume that I'm some red pill fanboy and treat red pill like some kind of ideology, even though it's a praxeology. And uh, that's, that's, not entirely, that's not entirely the truth, like at all, not even remotely. I have a very unique position on the red pill, such though that I imagine many people would accuse me of being purple pill, but I'm not. Purple pill, by definition, means like, you as a man believe in uh, half alpha, half beta, and you want to provide both sets of traits uh, at the same time. And I fundamentally disagree with that as well. The only, the only issue that I actually have with the red pill, and even though I like pretty much agree with it entirely, because it is the truth, it's just the truth, um, it's, like, it's, it's how people are using it. And that's my actual issue with the red pill, and that's part of my position on the red pill. So do I believe uh, that men have this thing called masculine idealism? Yes, I do. Do I believe that women have female solipsism? Yes, I do. Masculine idealism meaning men are innately born, you know, from birth to be selfless or more selfless than women. And women are innately by birth are more selfish uh, than men. And we have proof of that everywhere. You know, uh, why do you think women spend all the money, right? Most people thought it was because women were taking care of children, but that had nothing to do with it. Because now there are more childless uh, women in history, especially in Western society, and still they spend way more money than men do. I mean, everyone just understands that naturally. We all understand that naturally, and that's just kind of how it is. So... Based on that, what's the point? Well, these things, I, I find these things are pretty self-evident. You know, the male sexual strategy is polygyny. The female sexual strategy is hypergamy and how to deal with that. You know, women's penchant for competition anxiety, you know, and basically how you as a man have to be aware of these things. And then also there's the different life phases of women, like break phase and the party years, also known as the hoe years, right? And then there's the uh, epiphany phase and transition phase and the security phase and then development phase and then post-development phase and so on and so forth. And like new security phase to like end their life, you know, with like, these things are true. These things are true. I don't disagree with anything in the Rational Mail books or what Rollo Tomasi has said in the books, in the Rational Mail, Volumes 1 through 5. I don't disagree with any of his points. What I disagree with is how they're being used. That's the problem. I see men oftentimes using the red pill as a way to, uh, or as an excuse, or as justification to essentially pump and dump every single woman they, they have the opportunity to do that. I can't do that. I don't, uh, I don't believe in pump and dump. I don't believe in that at all. If I have sexual relations with a woman, it's because I intend to keep her. It's an intention, right? You can go back to uh, my season four content on this YouTube channel to actually 
understand what that position is. Most people would call that content from my blue pill days, but you know what? I still believe in everything I said in the season four content, so just go watch season four playlist, and you'll understand that. Also, sorry I haven't been around. Like, I was doing the ego hacking by text course, had to make sure it was just absolutely perfect. When it was released, there was a few bits of missing content, and uh, all that content has been added. And I also added some uh, bonus content as well, just to make it even better. And uh, for the first time within that course, I'm actually showcasing exactly how I psychoanalyze somebody from their text messages, will simultaneously demonstrate how to ego hack them. And I actually ego hack two people, uh, 15 minutes, go over it 15 minutes per person in a 30 minute video within the course. In my opinion, it's, my, it's probably my best work, probably my best work ever. And uh, I highly, uh, highly recommend you guys check that out. This course is ultimately a mimetic weapon. Uh, teaching people to psychoanalyze by text and teaching people how to social engineer each other through text messages. But the thing is, is that all the social engineering techniques that are presented in the course are directly applicable even outside of a text-based context. So the course is entirely relevant. Not only that, I have provided a specific framework from within the course for extroverted thinkers especially to psychoanalyze people accurately. We're actually working on a project right now to uh, automate that process and uh, add a tool to Ucha basically to make it easy for you to psychoanalyze people like in a kiosk format basically. You just put in a bunch of text it'll give you an output in terms of their type and maybe even potentially their octogram. Who knows? Uh, it'll be uh, really fascinating what we got going but it's coming. It's coming along very well. Um, and we're getting closer every single day. I look forward to those features being uh, available to this community so that you guys can psychoanalyze each other even more accurately than before. And in fact, actually, within the last two days, I even unlocked a certain ability to uh, psychoanalyze people without even using the type grid. That makes it even easier, even easier to do it. So, I mean, I know people think I'm crazy with Ucha only having four questions to psychoanalyze people and I, I'm very confident with the first three questions, but the fourth question needs to be rewritten a little bit. I might also rewrite the first two questions or at least add additional context to them. But it's just human beings don't really write very much. So I might actually just put in some two, small two minute videos of explanation videos in Ucha as well, just nest them in there and embed them in there or whatever so that you folks can actually uh, you know, gain gain from that, which, which would be pretty fun, let's be honest. This cigar is extremely strong. <laughs> it's, it's hard to keep it in my mouth. It's very strong. It's a, uh, a Laranja Espinosa. It's a creamsicle. It tastes great. I highly recommend uh, this one with the notes that it has. It's excellent. So yeah, um, check out Ego Hacking by Text. It's at egohackingbytext.com. And uh, if you guys are lucky, it still has pre-order pricing, but I don't think so. I think it's 100 bucks a course right now. Plus, we have our master class. And you're going to want to get in the master class because the master class, we're going to be uh, adding additional discoveries uh, within the master class to make it even easier uh, for you to ego hack people. It's a whole new layer of social engineering than anyone's really originally thought possible. So we're going to be going in really deep, nice deep dive within the master class. You're going to want it. It's going to be at least two hours long. It might even be three hours long. So it's, we're going to have it available uh, as a live stream. So anyone who has master class can participate. Once the live stream is over, the recording will be made available in the ego hacking by text master class area of the course that is available at csjoseph.life forward slash portal. So yeah, sales pitch over. So what is my position on the red pill, right? So I'm not a purple pill guy, but most people accuse me of being purple pill. And it's because I believe in this thing called 
masculine idealism. The problem is, is that masculine idealism ultimately is unattractive to women and definitely something that can get you as a man in trouble. That's why rites of passage were invented to prevent masculine idealism from taking over a man's life. This matters. And it matters because a lot of people don't even realize. They don't even realize that like <coughs> they don't even realize how to use the red pill properly. This is one of the things that's really, really bothered me. Because I've seen, like I said, people use the red pill as just this excuse to pump and dump women, which I, I, I completely disagree with. I have never felt okay with that. And it, it's so prevalent in our culture that even women expect it. And now women are actually starting to pump and dump men. And it's just, it's honestly, it's disgusting. I find it entirely disgusting. Um, and uh, there's no room for love anymore. There's no room for romance anymore. And... Uh, and it's just entirely ridiculous. You know, I've, I've literally had women in my life tell me to my face, some closer to me than others, uh, literally tell me that, you know, my effort and my investment, my relationship equity doesn't matter. And why is that? Well, because the beta traits, you know, protection, parental investment, and provisioning, right? Those, those beta traits, women can get all that for themselves. They can go get a job. They can provide for themselves. Society gives them the illusion of protection, so they don't need protection. And they certainly don't need parental investment because women think that they can parent children better anyway. Uh, and there's no really any need for masculine influence as they're conditioned by society to think or believe. That sucks. That sucks a lot. I mean, we have a child support society instead of a child rearing society. And because of that, you know, the beta male traits are no longer attractive to women at all. They're just not. And 80% of them out there, according to Tomasi, represent men who lead with beta traits. And alpha traits are secondary to them. And these are the men who actually want committed, long-term committed relationships. These are the men uh, who would like marriage. These are the men, but, you know, they're completely invisible to women. And women are only really attracted to men with alpha traits, with alpha fitness, alpha genetics, uh, alpha selfishness, alpha leadership. They're only attracted to those men. The problem is, is that those men don't want commitment. They don't want relationships. So they end up becoming alpha widows. They end up getting pregnant, impregnated by those men, and they end up becoming single moms, which just ends up making the decay of society even further, right? Way worse. Also, all those of you who complain about me not looking at the camera, get over yourselves. Like, I don't care. Like, it's my show. I do whatever I want. Sometimes looking off into the distance helps me think. It's one of the reasons why I'm smoking a cigar. Because it puts me in my ISFJ subconscious, which allows my memory recall a lot better because I have better access to my own introverted sensing when I smoke. So, like, get off my back. I'm tired of it. It's, like, super annoying. So anyway, <clears throat> women just don't even notice these 80% of men out there. And this 80% of men, it's, it basically becomes like this suppressed masculinity that's going to create a power keg eventually, and it's going to explode, and we're going to have the bloodiest war we've ever seen in history over it. And imagine the aftermath of that war, and during the war, imagine the extremely high amounts of repressed and oppressed and suppressed masculinity in men from all these 80% of men that aren't even noticed by women because... You know, at most, 20% of men out there are screwing all the girls, when in reality it's actually 4.5% of men out there are screwing all the women, and the rest of the men out there get nothing. And uh, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for violence. Huge violence. And that's our future if we don't stop this now. If we don't stop fatherlessness, for example. Can't stop fatherless, fatherlessness unless we give men a reason to actually stay home, to actually stay with their family. We have to like give them a reason for that. But no, we don't do that. We never do that. Because what, what, what do men actually get now from women? What do they actually get out of being in a committed relationship? 
you know, man are sold in this idea of unlimited access to sexual intimacy. That's bullshit. That's entirely bullshit. Because when a man gets in a committed relationship, she gets secure in the relationship. And because society is enabling her solipsism, solipsism is their innate female entitlement, her innate female selfishness. Because society is enabling women, especially when it comes to beta traits, you know, society providing the protection, giving women the opportunity to provide for themselves, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but just makes men invisible to her. Most men, 80% of men, invisible to her. Like, what's the point? You know, like, seriously, what's the point? You know, frequency of sex goes down, quality of sex goes down, the women uh, that they're committed to let their bodies go. So... Men don't really get much out of the relationship. In fact, men don't really even need much from women anyway. So what little that they want from women is far more important than what women want from men, technically, because men want so little from women. It's not much. It's really not that much. So because of that, what's in it for the men? Nothing. There's, there's not much anything in it for the men. So that equals pump and dump, pump and dump, pump and dump. Because why, why commit to a woman? This is why the red pill even exists. It exists because of that problem. Men don't really get anything out of committed relationships. And let's say, let's, let's imagine for a second that they did get something out of committed relationships. 83% of all divorce in the United States of America are initiated by women anyway. So men aren't really... Like, in the end, men also lose half their assets, have to pay alimony, have to pay child support, and they never get to see their children anyway. And their children ends up getting raised by a loser because that's all the women can actually get with is a loser because only a loser man would be willing to take care of another woman's children, basically, right? Now, that's not entirely true. It's more of just what I'm saying. A, a beta male would do that, take care of another man's children. And that, too, ends up becoming a serious problem. A very serious problem. So the red pill was created because men aren't getting anything out of relationships. They're not getting anything out of commitment. So, and the red pill was supposed to be this answer to help men deal with the fact that commitment just leads to them getting completely screwed over. And if you don't believe me, you're either too old to notice or you're too young and naive to notice. Because the reality of the situation is that men in general walk in quiet desperation. You can actually look that term up. There's even a nice article in medium.com talking about how men walk in quiet desperation. Because this society, it's, it's ultimately not for men at all. It has nothing to do with it. It's not for men. It's not by men, even though it was men who actually forged this society, right? So because of that, all the men are screwed. Just completely screwed. Um, if you were to ask me, you know, Chase, do you, do you think your children have a future? I'd say no. Because on one hand, obviously my boys are screwed. But on the other hand, my, you know, like my girls are screwed too. My daughters are screwed. Uh, my girls are screwed. Because they're not going to have any man commit to them. Because why would a man commit to them? Because, you know, they're brainwashed by this bullshit society, this bullshit Western society. Why do you think Andrew Tate, of all people, converted to Islam? Because I have no choice but to admit that Islamic society is superior to our society in every way. Because in Islamic society, like, the family, family exists there. Family doesn't exist here. There's no family here in this bullshit Babylonian Western society. So, because that... We have this fatherlessness problem. We have a decay in masculinity and thus a decay in uh, femininity as a result. You know, women would rather stick to their careers. You know, in my life, uh, you know, I had a woman uh, pick her, uh, her career over me. And uh, that really sucked. And I ended up breaking up with her because of it. It's just like, okay. You know, I, I told her the truth. I just, I told her the straight up truth. I'm just like, look, you know... I like to be made a top priority here, you know, but if you want to put your career over me, because what, you want to make an impact? Go ahead. And she goes on and on and on talking about 
more independence, more independence, more independence. I'm like, yeah, sure. You can have that independence. Go be an independent woman. But for some reason, you're going to be an independent woman who joins the military and wants to take orders from a dude, likely, statistically likely. You want to take orders from a dude who outranks you for a minimum of the next three years of your life. And you call that independence? I don't get it. I really, I really don't get that. Like that, that makes literally no sense to me whatsoever, you know? So I'm just like, what the hell, dude? Okay. I I bet that, I bet that's really important to you, you know? And it's so funny how like, isn't, um, you know, like my, my ex, she, she has this thing where it's like, yeah, uh, you know, she sends me messages every now and then complaining about, you know, marriage and and all this. And I'm like, well, you're not even married. In fact, you've never been married. So why do you get an opinion on it? And here you are now in your forties and, uh, you, you, what? Like you, you just masquerade around, you know, your life and in the internet, you know, wearing a mask, being paranoid. And then, you know, no one's interested in committing to you. I mean, why do you think that is? And that's what the red pill was for, to try to help men cope with that situation. The problem is, is that men realize that they couldn't cope with the situation. And as true as the red pill is, because it is truth, men realize they can't cope with it. They can't cope with it at all. Um, Because there's no reward. There's no reward for being in a committed relationship. So as a result, Men end up using the red pill basically as a platform or an excuse or a justification to pump and dump women, basically. They just pump and dump. On top of the fact that like society is structured in such a way where it requires multiple incomes to raise children. So the women, the mothers of children are forced to work anyway so that those children are raised by society and indoctrinated and conditioned by society to continue the same cycle because those who run the society do not want masculinity to return because if it returns, masculinity would naturally challenge their power. So that they, they want to stay in power, right? You know, because those who are in power want to keep it, right? This is why I maintain that the most powerful person in the world right now is actually an INFP. I, I, I completely believe that. I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised about that at all. So that ends up being a really sucky situation you know like men don't really get anything out of that and that sucks that just sucks straight up like what's the point you know what's the point now wow it is cold and there is snow everywhere you guys want to see the snow real quick you can check it out look at that look at all that snow it's beautiful here though in this winter wonderland but i still you know I still go out and I still get my job done for you folks anyway. So, so that's a huge issue. You know, like men, men, as much as men would love to utilize their masculine idealism and to fall in love with women, you know, and and be romantic towards them and, you know, take care of them, do their beta traits, even their alpha traits. They still like, it doesn't matter how alpha they are. They still have the same problem anyway. So, you know, most people assume that the red pill is all about, okay, well, let's just emphasize alpha traits, alpha traits, so I can get more women. You're like, yeah, sure. You're going to get laid more. You're going to have more women. But, you know, and then they teach this adage where it's like, you know, well, it's not your turn. You know, men can't even, can't even keep a woman anymore. They just can't. Because now we have the society of open hypergamy. Which, mark my words. You know, even uh, Tomasi warned that of happening in uh, Rational Mail Volume 4 and Volume 5 which is pretty rough. So the bottom line is, is that right now, based on society's current situation and kind of how things are in Western society, there's just no hope for men. There's no hope whatsoever. There's zero hope. There's no hope for long lasting commitment. There's no hope for long-term relationships working out. You know, when it comes to Gen Z and younger, you know, millennials may have a little bit of hope, but really they don't, you know, so millennials and newer, they just, they just don't have it, you know, And it's going to lead to a violent catastrophe, an absolute violent catastrophe. Unless things change, we're literally going to lose the earth. I mean, it's even prophesied in the book of Malachi, where 
God the Creator is like, I'm going to strike the land with a decree of utter destruction unless this gets changed somehow, right? Which is a huge issue. It's why I care about fatherlessness. It's why I care about turning the hearts of sons to the father, you know, to their fathers and hearts of fathers to their sons. It's a big deal. It's why I teach this psychology, behavioral psychology, evolutionary psychology, personality typing, Jungian analytical psychology. That's why I teach it basically in an effort to keep men at home with their children to prevent fatherlessness, to bring back masculinity. But the problem is, is like, what's the point? What's the point? The things that the red pill teaches are true, but the only logical conclusion that men can come up with after coming to know the red pill and swallowing the red pill is that there isn't anything, there, there is nothing in it for them. There's absolutely, especially if you're like the 80% dejected. Dejection means where you as a man, you're not even a choice to a woman. You're not even noticed. That's dejection. And the other 20% of men have to deal with rejection. Rejection, it feels bad when you get rejected, but it's fleeting and it goes away. And then you just try out another woman, right? Until you're not rejected anymore. But like commitment, statistically commitment is impossible. It's impossible. Getting married, getting legally married is like the worst decision a man could ever make. So basically now men are forced to have multiple relationships with multiple women that are all unfulfilling and low quality and they end up just cycling them through. They call this plate theory, just cycling them through on a roster basically because those women don't want to commit. And those women, especially especially the most attractive ones from 20 to 25, they won't commit at all. And then all of a sudden, and, well, and they don't even start considering commitment until the epiphany phase, which is when they realize that their looks cannot compete with younger girls anymore. But then they can't get the higher value men anymore who are 35 to 42, who have all of the money and the skills and the fitness because they've learned, right? And for the first time in their lives, they're able to attract women 20 to 25. And all of a sudden, like, you know, that's, that, that's their lot in life, right? Well, the problem is, is that, like, there's still, it's, commitment still carries the danger because as soon as, like, women hit development phase, as soon as they hit 36, they're going to divorce you anyway. This actually, like, happened to a family member of mine recently. Um, actually two family members of mine this happened to recently um, and one of those family members I egregiously disagree with how she handled it but that's another story um, but yeah like there's no point it's, it's hopeless it's absolutely hopeless or is it so what ends up happening now is that like there's only a few things that can be done, right? Masculine idealism is something that, this, this is my main problem with the red pill right here. The, ma the red pill is like, your masculine idealism is entirely worthless. And you may, you may as well not bring your beta traits to the table at all, because that's what masculine idealism is, right? The uh, men's penchant for being selfless. As much as women like to project their own solipsism upon men, their own selfishness upon men, the reality of the situation is, is that men are technically more selfless as producers than women who are natural consumers, okay? That's just biology, okay? But, you know, women like to pretend men are just as selfish as they are. Women like to pretend that men are having just as much as sex as they are. When the reality of the situation is, that's not true. Women in general, especially millennials and younger, especially Gen Z and younger, Gen Z and alpha generation, the majority of them are more hoish than they've ever been in the, in the history of mankind, basically. Because society is enabling them. You know, and, and masculine idealism, like that, that men's innate thing for being selfless, like that's why the rite of passage existed because a rite of passage would teach a man that you better not be selfless. It teaches a man that you better be selfish because your life will be required of you. Because you will die. You will die for this tribe. You will die for this society. You will die for your woman. You will die. That's why it is written, there's no greater love than when a man gives up his life for his beloved. The problem is, is that women aren't grateful for that. They're not grateful for men risking their lives for them, working hard and doing dangerous jobs, fighting wars and dying for them. You don't think that's true? Well, look at all the people, all the soldiers, all the families that were broken up from the wars that this country has fought over the last 20 years. Oh wait, every 
every war that's ever fought, but whatever, you know, let's just look at the last 20 years, for example, and it's entirely ridiculous. We have 18-year-olds being deployed right now, 18, 19-year-olds being deployed right now to Operation Enduring Freedom and, you know, and ultimately Iraqi Freedom or whatever, like, being deployed in those places for a war that started before they were even born. Like, that's how ridiculous this country is. That's how ridiculous Western society is. Willing to sacrifice men, and ultimately women, you know, for its own agenda, while everyone else is entirely unhappy. You know, there's a study that's, that came out that said that by 2030, all working age, like um, over 50% of working age women will be alone. And uh, will, not, will be childless, will not be mothers, and will be, will be dog moms and cat moms by the time they're 40. That's ridiculous. So the problem is, is that men look at the red pill, and they swallow the red pill, and they realize that the only lot in life is just a pump and dump. That's all they got. That's all they got. That's all they get to look forward to is just pump and dump. Pump and dump. Constantly. And I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it at all. I don't live my life that way, contrary to popular belief. But I don't. You know, I very much care about a family. I very much care about having little ones. I very much care about not increasing the fatherlessness in the world. But it's not me increasing the fatherlessness, especially in my own life. Because people are like, well, why are you divorced? Er. And I'm like, well, because the women be crazy. That's why. Because the women don't care about family. They care about themselves. They put themselves above the family. <coughs> you know, and what's the rite of passage that's supposed to teach women on how to be selfless, to let go of their selfishness, and as much as the rite of passage of men is to let go of their selflessness and become more selfish, you know, the rite of passage which proves that they're strong enough to be a man and respected by man, by, as men by society itself, because society used to respect men, but now it doesn't. Society has to keep men underneath its boot lest men rise up and challenge its power. The rite of passage that was supposed to make women more selfless was giving birth. Giving birth and taking care of children. But now, you know, we don't even have that anymore. Women just abort their children or they put them up for adoption or they end up becoming single moms. And it just ends up becoming this cycle of pain and hatred. You know, so many of my coaching clients, the majority of the men in, the, my, in my coaching clients hate their fathers, hate them. When the reality is they only hate them because they don't understand them because they don't understand because they haven't gone through that pain themselves. And eventually they will go through that pain and they'll realize, oh crap, I misjudged my dad. And I'm like, yeah, you think anything's gonna change? You think anything's gonna change at all? So, I don't agree with the red pill, like getting rid of masculine idealism and completely shitting all over the, you know, the, the beta traits. The beta traits are necessary. The thing is, though, I'm not advocating for the purple pill, which is 50% beta, 50% alpha. I'm saying you as a man should be responsible for being as alpha as possible, but you shouldn't entirely abandon your beta traits either. You shouldn't abandon your masculine idealism, which is your nature, whereas you being alpha is technically more nurture, actually. Maybe nature to a few, but again, that's like 20% of men and ultimately 4.5% of men who are the ones actually getting laid, and no one else is. So because of that, that continues to be a serious, serious issue. And because of that, we don't have a future in society. This right here is the reason why our society will collapse. And it's not because, you know, the family is broken, the nuclear family is an entirely failed construct in its own right, which I've explained many times. But the issue is, like, you know, there's just, men don't really get out of it. And this, they get anything out of it. This is what the red pills taught men. So because of that, we have now this pump and dump culture. We have this culture where men are abandoning their masculine idealism and going all out selfish entirely. And uh, spending everything on themselves and their own pleasures, you know. Because, like, you, you know, you talk about, like, you know, Tomasi talks about how we're entering into a world where we already have open hypergamy. It's already happened. And he, he, he warned about open hypergamy being a thing in his first volume that he wrote back in, like, 2014. But then now it's 2022, about to be 2023, and open hypergamy is the norm. And he's already warning about how women, if they don't like, if they don't like having sex with you, if they didn't enjoy themselves... They can claim that you raped them, basically, and then you're really screwed. But the word, like, here's my warning. Here's what's coming next. You want to know what's coming next? Eventually, our society is going to get so screwed up that in order for a man to get laid at all, he'll have to pay for it. 100%. Like, seriously. 
that's our future. Like that's, that's the only way it's going to happen. So basically prostitution is just going to become the absolute total social norm for men entirely. Where you as a man can look at your daughters and realize that they're all going to turn into whores one day. That's our future. That is our collective future. Where literally the only way a man will have sexual access is through money. And that's it. And nothing else. That is our future. That is our future. You know, I'm sure Tomasi will start talking about it very soon. You'll see. You'll see. He'll start talking about it on his podcast or maybe he'll talk about it in the next book. But it is inevitable. It is inevitable. If society doesn't change, all sexuality will be bought and paid for. It'll just be another commerce item. Don't believe me? Look at Japan. It basically kind of is how it is in Japan right now. Don't believe me? Go look at Japan. Japan is the leader in this area. Everything is bought and paid for. Money is the only way a man has access to sexuality. Therefore, men are only these slave drones working for society, basically. And that sucks. Sucks to be them. And that's our future. Slaves. Because of how, because, you know, we can't allow masculinity to exist because it would bring revolution and take out the elite. Ooh, can't have that. See what I'm saying? So that's our future, folks. That's our future. You know, the red pill teaches against masculine idealism, and I totally understand why. I don't agree with it, but I understand why. I think a man should be primarily alpha, but not abandon his masculine traits entirely. But that doesn't mean it's purple pill. It's not purple pill at all. You know, like, purple pill is 50% uh, alpha traits, 50% beta traits. But the thing is, is like, it's not about how alpha a man is. It doesn't matter how alpha a man is. It doesn't matter at all. Because at the end of the day, development phase is coming. Statistically, 83% of divorces out there are initiated by women. And your woman that you have a committed relationship with is just going to divorce you anyway. So there's no point. There's just no point. Why do you think Andrew Tate converted to Islam? Like, because that, the, those statistics are way better in an Islamic world. And, and this is why so many men are flocking to Islam. Because at least with Islam, they can have a family. At least with Islam, they can have respectful women. With Islam, they can raise children. You see what I'm saying? With Islam, they can actually have a legacy. And it's no, it isn't to any wonder that Islam just hasn't entirely swallowed the world up yet. It will. It will. Mark my words. It will. It absolutely will swallow up the world. And I don't mind that. I, I actually don't mind. I don't mind if Islam just completely takes over the world. Because at this rate, it will. It absolutely will. Mark my words. You know, because in, in, in non-Islamic uh, society, sexuality will be bought and paid for. And in Islamic society, men actually have a chance at happiness. And Andrew Tate figured this out. Sure, he gets other benefits because Muslim society is very anti-elite. Um, you know, and there's some protections there and they have their own ways of doing commerce, whatnot. But eventually, I'm sure they too will be hella challenged by uh, the beast that rises from the sea, also known as Western society. And uh, there's going to be a war. And it's going to be bloody. It's going to be a very big war because Islam itself is going to eventually challenge the power of the elite. And they're going to have to deal with it. And as much as Eastern society is also going to be a problem in certain cases. But Eastern society ain't any better than Western society. Things are going downhill there. So at this point, if you look at all the consequences, we have no future. We have no future at all. This is why I recommend a different lifestyle. You know, like a, a polygynous one. You know, a man who has multiple women committed to him. They all have children. They all help each other out. They help each other out with mothering. They help each other with babysitting, raising children. They work hard together. You know, as, as exemplified in the book, The Red Tent, which if you haven't read The Red Tent, read it. Man or woman, read the red tent and come to understand how things worked in ancient times and how, you know, that's a much better, healthier family structure than what we have now with the nuclear family, which is a freaking travesty. It's entirely ridiculous. So yeah, like, folks, like th this, this is our future. This is, this is what we get to look forward to. This is what your children get to inherit. This is what the children get to inherit in Western society. Are you, are you happy about your sons being conditioned to pay for sex? And the only way they ever get sexuality is that they're paying for it. Are you happy about that? 
Are you happy that your daughters are basically made to be prostitutes? Are you happy about that too? Because that's your future. Oh wait, you don't believe me? Well, that's exactly what happened to the Germans in the 1920s with Berlin. After the Treaty of Versailles, Berlin became like Las Vegas. You could literally pay for women and children with money. They had the worst sex trafficking in the world the world has ever seen, basically. And it was open, and it was public, and it was accepted. You don't think that's coming to our society everywhere within Western society? I tell you the truth. It is our future, and in fact, it's our immediate future. You will see that by the end of this decade. I promise you, mark my words. Mark my words. So unless we stop fatherlessness, unless we turn the hearts of fathers to their sons, the hearts of sons to their fathers, unless we bring back masculinity, that's our future. And that's your children's future. When you're watching this, do you want that for your grandchildren? Really? Do you want that life of slavery? Really? Where there is no such thing as happiness anymore in this world? And then all of a sudden they're trying to bring like transhumanism and give people immortality via technology so they stay stuck in this slave world? Because as it is written, Revelation chapter 9, and they will seek death but not find it? Yeah, it's coming, folks. Is that really what you want? Watch out. The red pill, it's a painful journey. It's a painful pill to swallow. But it's even more painful than when you as a man realize that you have basically no choice. You have no choice but to pump and dump. You have no choice but to be with multiple women, to leverage competition anxiety against women so that they treat you better because they've been conditioned by society to not treat you with respect, to not give you special treatment, to not honor your effort. I'm projecting when I say honor effort, by the way, because that's my cognitive origin of satisfaction, but, which is all about effort. But um, that's why ENTP and ISFJ men get screwed over the most by Western society women because that's our love language, acts of service. You see, you know, we make, it, we make everything so convenient for the women in our lives, hoping that they would make things convenient for us, you know, and reward us in the process. But no woman finds that attractive because that's based on relationship equity. And the reality of the situation is, according to the red pill, no woman cares or gives a damn about your relationship investment or your relationship equity as a man. No one cares. So you're almost forced. You're almost forced to even have some, a shred of enjoyment or a shred of happiness in your life. You have to do pump and dump. You have to abandon your masculine idealism. You have to turn off 50% of your masculinity. You know, because a truly masculine man should be enough to satisfy a woman's sexual strategy of hypergamy to provide all of the alpha traits and all the beta traits simultaneously, with alpha traits being primary and beta traits being secondary which is my true position on the red pill. Not this purple pill 50-50 bullshit. It's all about primaries and secondaries. You know, yin and yang equilibrium, where the yin is like the beta male traits and the yang is the alpha male traits, basically. So, it's a conundrum. It's very rough. You know, and that's why I live my life, you know, like in the way that I have. Ever since I, you know, you know, made decisions to do so when I was like 25, 26 years old, I made those decisions. I lived my life accordingly, right? I mean, this is like why I chose my lifestyle. I chose it because someone has to actually be an example to the men. Someone's got to show that it can be done. How is it possible if the hearts of fathers can be turned to their sons, the hearts of sons to their fathers? Unless men have something actually worth fighting for and worth dying for, right? That's the entire point, right? I mean, like, for example, you know, they, men don't have anything worth fighting for or dying for right now. And because of that, that's ultimately what masculinity is all about. There's no reward for being masculine in general anymore, not within this culture. And that's a, that's a huge problem. Like a very big problem. And it's pretty sad. It's really sad. And that's ultimately, that's ultimately my concern. You know, if I can live my life the way that I do live it based on my lifestyle and be an example to fellow men, if they can actually see what's possible, 
they actually can know what's possible, if they know that they can have a family once again, if they know that they can go home to a woman that gives them all the special treatment in the world and is respectful towards them, knowing that that woman is not going to abandon them or take anything from them, much less their children from them. That'd be nice. That'd be really nice. That's the thing, like, like I said, you know, it's just, there's nothing but despair all over this, uh, this world, this Western society. It's just despairing. You know, men need to have something worth fighting for. They need to have something worth dying for. You know, for example, like what the red pill talks about, well, you know, plate theory, you know, men having multiple women they can see that it's done okay yeah right now it's being utilized from a pump and dump perspective but if they can actually structure their lives in such a way <laughs> if they can actually structure their lives in such a way where uh, they know it's possible maybe it's possible that they could keep those women right maybe it's possible they could have a very large family Maybe it's possible all of a sudden their children have a future. Maybe all of a sudden that's worth fighting for. Maybe all of a sudden that's worth dying for. Maybe all of a sudden masculinity would return because they see people, especially for example in the ego hacker community, there's some men who have stepped up within the community who have chosen this lifestyle and are living by this lifestyle and learning how to live by this lifestyle. Learning how to protect themselves against family law, learning how to protect their assets, learning how to become capable entrepreneurs, l getting combat trained, getting survival trained, you know, warrior archetype, producing more than they consume through king archetype, helping other men get their magician archetype. And then after all that's done, getting to a point where we can finally, uh, finally enjoy life, if that's even possible. Oftentimes I feel like, you know, my journey as a man has just been like, you know, fight the struggle so that other men in tomorrow will enjoy the fruits of my labor while I myself have no such enjoyment. It's so interesting because, you know, like Luthen's speech that he gave in uh, the Andor show, I believe it was Andor episode 10 or 11 where he gave his famous speech and he's an INTJ, Luthen. And, uh, I mean, I entirely identify with that. You know, I'm already so far gone with how I live my life, with how I see society, that there's just no turning back. And obviously, I may not eat the fruit of my own labor. Because, like, the reality of the situation is, I often look at my table, and I see within the ego hacker community, many people receiving healing, many people being fed and eating of it, but I often do not eat at my own table. But it's not about me. It's about having a future, just like it is written. For I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and to give you a future and a hope. I figure that if the men within the ego hacker community who have stepped up to prove that this lifestyle can be done, that these men represent an example to other men to show that it can be done. And by showing that it can be done, other men will follow. And other men will not take no for an answer anymore. Other men will know that they actually can be happy, that they can have a family, a family of their own design, a family worth fighting for and a family worth dying for, such that they will never even allow the elite to prevent them from reaching their happiness. That is what masculinity is all about, carving its own path forward amidst the chaos and bringing order to chaos. And that's the order that I've decided for my life, as is necessary. You know, many people just don't understand. They want to lead with judgment. But the reality of the situation is, is things are so bad out there, especially for men, that they don't even realize the consequences. Because without masculinity, this society will fall. This society will devolve into what I warrant. All access to sexuality will become a financial transaction. Think about it. It's going to happen. Well, 
thing is, is that if it becomes a financial transaction, then those men are legally protected from that, you see? It's already set up the stage, and what Tomasi has predicted is actually starting to come true right now, and the stage is set. All that's left now is to make it happen, and as soon as this happens, our society would be no different than Berlin in the 1920s. No different. And then, guess what's going to happen? What well, always happens when society devolves to the same level as Berlin in the 1920s? I'll tell you what happens. Something far worse than Nazi Germany is coming. And it's going to be very bloody. And if you're not careful, if you're not ready, if you're not willing to participate in the movement and put a stop to fatherlessness and bring back masculinity and turn the hearts of fathers to their sons, the hearts of sons to their fathers, you will lose everything. Because like I said, if someone were to come up to ask me, hey Chase, do you think your children have a future in this society? I would say no. No, they don't. And that's why we have no choice but to move forward and to press forward. So help me God. So help us God. Have a good night, folks. See you on the next episode.